invite you to join us for the morning worship service of Trinity on the Hill United Methodist Church. We welcome you as we worship the Lord together. in the name of the Lord on a little donkey. 2,000 years ago, Christ came into Jerusalem so all the world would know he was fulfilling prophecy. He was proclaiming, Hosanna, Hosanna, and the people yelled in the streets, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Welcome to this Palm Sunday, the beginning of our Holy Week together. So good to see each and every one of you. We hope that this is a, a great time to be getting launching into that week as a it is a great time in the, in the life of Christians. If you would, please, if you're a guest with us today, sign in on the registration folder. You'll see that on each and every pew. We want you to know as a guest you are welcome to this place. Glad that you are here. If you have any questions about us, let us know as we worship our God. Hosanna, Hosanna, in spirit and in truth. Please join me now in the call to worship printed in the bulletin. We're going to ask that you remain seated so that the parade will not be hidden from you as the children and the choirs come through the congregation. Open the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to God. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Once more, let us repeat the all section. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Our processional hymn is number 278, Hosanna. Loud Hosanna, remain seated for the parade of palms.
parents, if you will stand right now, all of these children are going to find you, okay? I hope you saved them a little spot. And we're going to go right into our morning prayer chorus. So children, if you'll go find your parents, parents stand up so they can find you, okay? I'm so glad to turn them over to you. We've enjoyed this prayer chorus throughout Lent, and it speaks of the mercy of God, the undeserving, unearned mercy of God. And sometimes, as Christians, we take that grace and mercy for granted, don't we? Because we're so used to it being there. I love this chorus because of what it says. May we never lose the wonder of God's mercy. There's plenty of room up here at this kneeling rail, and it's a great tradition here that people come. If you would like, spend some time on your knees as we go into our prayer time. Let's sing together. May I never lose. May I never. Oh God, what a glorious morning. What a wonderful sight to see all of these children in this magnificent choir singing the songs that remind us of this special season of the year. We're grateful for Holy Week because we remember that Jesus steadfastly turned his face to go to Jerusalem so that he might die on that cross for the sins not just of those who lived in that day, but for the sins of all the people to come. We prepare, as we prepare for Easter this year, let us remember that that unconditional love is ours. Invite Jesus to come into our hearts triumphantly as he came into that city of Jerusalem so long ago. Forgive us for those times when we focus all of our attention, our energy on trivial matters, when we need to be concerned about things that really make a difference in our lives, in the lives of those we encounter, in the world in which we live. Oh God, we know we live in a world where there's danger, where there's hurt, where there's so many people struggling. And we ask this day that we will do our part to bring peace and, and joy and understanding in this community and all around the world. For we remember that Jesus gave his life for those who are suffering, those who are hurting. Bless us, O Lord, this morning as we worship together. May everything that we say in this place and everything that happens here lift the name of Jesus higher and higher. And may when we leave this place, may we be devoted, committed to being servants of Christ wherever we go and whatever we do. Prepare our hearts for the coming of Easter and for that grand celebration. All of these things we pray in the name of Jesus, and then we join as one body to pray that prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
of my favorite hymns, especially this time of year, number 277, Tell Me the Stories of Jesus. Let's stand as we sing. Our children will come down for children's moments with Pastor Mike and everyone else. Greet each other in the name of Christ. Hi, thank you very much for watching the broadcast today. You know, as I picked up this palm branch, realize it's not perfect. It's a lot like me. It's got holes and has a few little flaws, but Jesus still accepts that praise more than we'll ever know. He loves and cares for us. In fact, the scripture teaches that God inhabits the praise of his people. As you praise and worship him this day, may it be a blessing to you like none other. Let's go to the children. God bless you. What a day this has been. I mean, a parade in the middle of church. Have you ever done that before? Last year, right? Okay. A parade in the middle. How many parades have you been into? Have you ever been in a parade before? Like, what kind of parade? Was it a Christmas parade? Yes. A Christmas parade? St. Patrick's Day parade? There you go. How about July 4th parade? Oh, yeah. Okay, now, freedom you the Freedom Parade. There you go. Thanksgiving Parade, Thanksgiving parade which is almost a Christmas parade. It's kind of hard to tell the difference, isn't it? The parade we just did. Yeah. Would you rather be in the parade or see the parade? Oh, you would rather be in the parade. All right. One more question. Can you hide a parade? No. Why not? Because it's it's too big. Or maybe it will be a sin to do it. Well, you never know. I think it's because it's too big. Because it's the reason the reason you do a parade is so that you can do it for everybody, right? Yes. So everybody can see, right? Now. What's the point of the palm parade? Who are we trying to see? You? No. no? Jesus. Jesus. That's right. We're not trying to hide Jesus. We're trying so that everybody can see Jesus. So that brings me to this question. And here's, this is what you, you're going to have to work hard on this one. How many pictures of Jesus do we have in this sanctuary? Three? Four? Six. All right. Let's 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 count them. One, 
two, three, look to the back, four, now where's the other one? You think there's one over there on the wall? Those are just symbols of Jesus. Those are not pictures of Jesus. I like the answer someone gave that everybody's a picture of Jesus. Isn't that, that's kind of a wonderful idea. I might even preach on that someday. You're a picture of Jesus. That's right. So today we're spreading the palm so that everyone can see Jesus. To see Jesus not only on Sunday morning, but to see Jesus every day of our lives. Whether you're at school or at home or walking around the neighborhood, people need to see Jesus. Or the picture inside of you. Or the picture of Jesus inside of you would be a good thing to do. Now, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you today that we got to be in the parade that shows that you are our King of Kings. Bless each child now that they will always be able to show who Jesus is in their lives. We pray this in your name and all God's children say, Amen. If you're going to Children's Church, you'll be following Miss Lillian out this door or you'll be returning to your parents. This is a huge day for us uh, at Trinity on the Hill as we try to coordinate children and choirs. And it's just a wonderful thing to watch. Uh, thanks to Danny and all of his uh, crew that organizes this so that we can have this great day. Uh, but this only begins the celebration. On Thursday night, uh, we will be having our communion service. We call it Monday Thursday. And it sounds like we can't make up our mind. Is it on Monday or is it on Thursday? Monday is the Latin for new commandment. And Greg will bring the message that night. And we will have communion together. Traditionally the night in which Jesus uh, shared the Last Supper with his disciples. Then on Friday we will have the crown of thorns service. Good Friday service. I hope you'll come back for that. And then there's Easter Sunday morning. Uh, in the past, we've had three worship services, but next Sunday there will only be two. We know it's spring break, so 8.30 or 11 o'clock. And you know that parking's always good at 8.30. We have GRU parking uh, over on the back side that uh, you can make your way over. Always plenty of parking that way if you enjoy a beautiful Easter Sunday morning walk. I hope you'll be joining us. Invite your neighbors and invite your friends. Now we invite the ushers to come forward that we might share God's bountiful gifts that he has given to us with the ministry through this church to our world and to our community. Let us pray. Gracious God in heaven, we do thank you that you have been so uh, bountifully blessing us in every way possible. May we now return to you our gifts and that each gift in each life may be used to the glory and the advancement of your kingdom here, there, and everywhere. We pray this in Jesus' name.
We continue this morning in the I Am series, but in a little bit different direction, especially if you're following along with the resource that Rob Fuquay wrote, uh, it's a little booklet, or if you're following along with the online devotional uh, series from the Upper Room. This is the week in which we would have normally done John chapter 14, I Am the Way, the Truth, and the Life. But as we position the different I am's throughout the season of Lent, this particular Sunday being the Palm and Passion Sunday. And as our church has traditionally done, we begin with the great celebration of palms, a great parade, if you will. But before we leave, we, always be, we are always sure that we are reminded that this great celebration ends with the suffering of Jesus throughout that week and finally his death on Good Friday. And so it seemed to me that there was another passage that might be a little bit more focused for us today on Passion Sunday. It is one that very few people even recognize as being one of the I am statements simply because of the translation. It's usually translated it is I or I am he and it doesn't look like the I am the bread, I am the, uh, the, the light and statements like that. But as we look at John 18 and pay attention to the way John actually writes it and what happens immediately after Jesus says this, we'll understand that there is a lot of power in this particular I am phrase this morning. And now next Sunday for Resurrection Sunday, of course, is the I am the resurrection and the life, which was not spoken on Easter Sunday, but rather uh, a week or about a week and a half before Easter in Lazarus uh, raising from the dead. I hope you'll come back and be here for that. So we're looking at the 18th chapter of John. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 8. And as you're able to stand, let us stand for honoring the reading of God's holy word. When Jesus had finished praying, he left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said, and Judas the traitor was standing there with the crowd. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. And Jesus answered, I told you, that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Three years previous to the reading of the scripture this morning, a middle-aged construction worker, a carpenter if you will, went to his local synagogue in Nazareth. And there he, he asked to read the scroll for the day. It happened to be the prophet Isaiah. He undid the scroll and he read from Isaiah these words. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free, to pro proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Everyone knew that this was a prophecy about their Messiah, about what he would do when he would come. When Jesus finished reading that scroll, he handed it back to the synagogue leader and he sat down. Now, when we sit down, it means the sermon's over, right? But when Jesus sat down, that's actually when they began to preach and teach. In antiquity, you preached and teach from a sitting position. 
That's why in Luke chapter 4 it says that they looked at him intently as he sat down because they were waiting for him to begin teaching. And boy, did he give them a wallop. Because when he finished reading about this coming Messiah, he said these words. Today, in your hearing, this prophecy is fulfilled. Wow. Now that was a bold statement for Jesus to make. But since this was his home church, they were kind of delighted that Jesus had chosen them to make this proclamation. But once they said how proud they were of him, Jesus said, now, wait a minute. You're expecting me to come into town and do all those miracles I've been doing up to this point so that you, little Nazareth, can be the center of the world. Well, I'll tell you one thing. A prophet's never welcomed him in his own hometown. Then he went on to give several stories from the Old Testament about how it wasn't even going to be the Jewish people who would be blessed, but even those Gentiles. And this angered his hometown folks. They were so angry with him, they forced him out of the synagogue, over to the hillside where the city was built on, and they threatened to push him over the hill. Somehow, he just walked right through it. Three years later, in today's scripture, we find Jesus not at his local synagogue, but in Jerusalem, the capital of his country. Not just the capital, a political uh, capital, but a religious center for his faith. And he has been preaching for three years, performing miracles, teaching beautiful lessons and parables. He has made some very bold claims about himself as well. The very claims that we've been talking about all Lenten long, where he says, I am. It all started in John chapter 8, where there was a story or a, a discussion about Abraham and Jesus. And Jesus made this statement, before Abraham was ever born, I am. Things started going downhill then. Because I am, if you remember, is the personal name that God gives his people in Exodus chapter 3. From then on, John very clearly shows us where Jesus made some claims with this I am. You remember those? I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good. I'm trying to help you out here. I'm going to say. I am the vine, which we used last week. And the one that we're not using this morning, I am the way, the truth, and the life. All these I am statements have created anger from the religious leaders in Jerusalem. And now Jesus has entered Jerusalem with this parade of palms where the crowds have kind of given him the honorary title. Yes, he's our Messiah. Yes, he's our king. And so the religious leaders want to get rid of him. They've been trying for some time to do that, but he's always around the crowds, and they're afraid the crowds might turn on themselves, and so they're afraid to do so. But now they have a traitor to help them out. Last week we talked about Judas, how he separated himself like a branch broken off a tree, separated himself from Jesus and the inner circle. And where he's gone is to these religious leaders to tell them that he will turn Jesus in. He will show them where Jesus is at a certain time during this holy week for, uh, 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 in Jerusalem, which is the Passover. And so that night, Judas leads them up to a hillside outside the city. Now this is good because now they can use force against Jesus. He's away from the crowds. It's the middle of the night. And as they approach this garden, this garden of Gethsemane, Jesus comes out of the garden and approaches the crowd. Whom are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth, they reply. And I've been working all week on how I should say the next line. Because I don't know if Jesus said it with a loud, booming voice. I am! Kind of like a God voice, you know? Or did he answer with a, a whisper? you know, sometimes whispers get your, get, will get your attention a lot faster than a, than a loud voice. But I guess it doesn't really matter whether it's a loud voice or, or a quiet voice because the reaction is what is so interesting in this story. Do you remember what happened when he said, I am? They went backwards and fell down. 
It's kind of like a comic book, you know, Batman, kapow, boom, and all the bad guys just flatten out. Well, that's the way I was reading it anyway. I am. You see, they were just looking for a man, some guy named Jesus who comes from a town by the name of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus, when he responds, uses God's personal name, I am. And the crowd falls away. It's the name of God. Now, if we were there, we would have fallen down because we were in awe of his majesty. And we would want to worship that majesty. But remember, the people who are coming out to find Jesus are not worshipers, are not believers. They are the enemies of his ministry. And they fall backwards, I think, because they are afraid of the power that he is displaying in his voice and his demeanor. But not everybody falls down. Not everybody falls down because there's an interesting uh, interpretation or translation of this particular section from Eugene Peterson. When he translates in the message, he says the soldiers recoiled and they are totally taken aback except Judas, his betrayer, who stands out like a sore thumb. Some reason Judas doesn't fall down. And I pondered about that, and I think the reason that Judas didn't fall down is because he's heard all this before. He's heard Jesus proclaim himself as the I am. I am the bread, I am the light, I am the vine, I am the good shepherd. He already knows these things, and perhaps this is why he's betraying Jesus. We don't know. But it also shows how far his heart and soul have been hardened in order to portray his rabbi, his master, in this dark night, in this lonely garden. N.T. Wright is a theologian and biblical scholar from England. When he talks about this particular passage, he says you can't help but notice that this garden that we're talking about is really a, a shadow of a garden that has come before. Listen to the words he describes the first garden. He came looking for someone. He came on the evening breeze as he always did. He came because they knew each other and used to spend time together. He came to the garden because that's where they always met. That's where he was at home. And he called and there was no answer. The man had hidden. Something had happened. Their friendship was soured. There was a bad taste in the air, a taste made worse by all the excuses and feeble stories that followed. Love and trust, the most fragile plants in that garden, had been trampled upon, and it would take a millennial to grow again. Does that ring any bells to a garden that you have read about in the Bible before? The Garden of Eden? The garden where God's first creation uh, was given the responsibility to grow and to prosper. But sin and disobedience came in. N.T. Wright says that our scripture is 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 a shadow of that scene of disobedience in the Old Testament. Now, when I first read that, I said, now, you know, we're pushing, we're pushing this imagery a little bit just because there's a garden there, right? But then... If you take seriously the way John writes his gospel, you've got to know that John, in his mind as he's writing, is comparing the the first garden with this particular garden of Gethsemane. If you don't believe me, look in the first chapter of John and look at the very first verse, and what is the phrase that it begins with? Sounds like some mummering going on. In the beginning is the way it starts. In the beginning was the word of God. Now, this is an easier question. What's the first phrase of the first chapter of the first verse of Genesis? In the beginning. John is writing the gospel story as a new Genesis for humanity. A new beginning for our redemption in the name of Jesus Christ. And so with that contrast started in the first chapter, the first verse of each of those books, Genesis and the gospel of John, we can very uh, well know that we can compare these two gardens. Whereas in the Garden of Eden, God came looking. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, evil men are the ones who come looking. In the Garden of Eden, God is looking for his first 
creation, his firstborn, if you will, in the Garden of Gethsemane. The evil men are looking for God's only begotten son, his firstborn. In the, Garden of Ge- in the Garden of Eden, Adam is hiding out of his guilt and shame. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus, the second Adam, stands tall and steps forward. In the Garden of Eden, we have disobedience and the shame and guilt that comes from it and the punishment that comes from it. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, we have obedience of Jesus Christ. And with that obedience comes salvation and glory for the whole world. What a, what a contrast that is between that hiding and shame and disobedience of the Garden of Eden and now we have Jesus standing out front bringing us his deep, deep love that the choir sang about. His obedience to death, even death upon the cross that brings him glory, brings us salvation. Jesus does not hide. Jesus does not hide. When I was a young boy, I used to love to watch war movies, you know. In my days, it was always, you know, the Germans and the Americans. It was, you know, that day, a long time ago. Y'all remember that Second World War thing? Okay. Uh, Anyway, I always loved the part about a movie where they would capture like a group of Germans, you know, and there was probably an, there was always an officer there leading them. And the officer would take off his uniform and take a private's uniform, mess up his hair, put some dirt on his face, you know, get all scruffy like that. And I would say, oh, no, he's going to get away with it. They're going to think he's just a private and not grill him or something. But, you know, as they're looking at all the privates, they notice that this guy's shoes are polished, whereas all the private's shoes are falling off their feet. (laughs) And uh, they always discover the officer who's trying to hide in the midst of his men. Jesus doesn't hide like that. He goes out in front of his people, in front of his men, to take the authority of that particular situation. Jesus does not hide. Joseph Goebbels, who was uh, Hitler's chief propagandist and one of the most evil people of his own inner circle, uh, in his personal diary, he actually makes some references to Mahatma Gandhi in India. Of course, he doesn't say favorable things about him because he's hoping that they will take over India. And his chief criticism of Gandhi is that he's he's a brilliant person, but he's a fool and a a fanatic for not organizing his people militarily, giving them weapons so that they can fight for independence. He thinks that if he would just simply forget this non-violent, non-resistant revolution and take up weapons, his revolution would succeed. But as we can tell you, history has proven that Gandhi's movement was correct because they won their independence while the Nazi military machine was destroyed. What what Goebbels thought was the uh, strength was really a weakness. And what Goebbels thought was a weakness was really a strength. In the same way, Jesus does not hide behind violence. If you read a couple of more verses beyond verse 8, you'll see that Peter was still thinking in the old mindset that if it's a Messiah coming, then he's going to be a king. He's going to be a military general. So he swips out his sword and he whacks away at Malchus, the servant's ear. And Jesus has to stop the whole procession. He says, stop this right now. This is not the way it's going to happen. And so he rebukes Peter for using force that night. Jesus does not hide behind that kind of violence. Maybe Jesus doesn't hide. He stands forward because he's remembering the words he just told his disciples in the 12th chapter of John. We covered this a couple of weeks ago under I am the good shepherd. Remember those words? The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I know my sheep. My sheep know me just as the father knows me and I know the father. And so I lay down my life for the sheep. And the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me. Hear that now. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. For I have the authority to lay it down and the authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my father. Jesus does not hide. In our scripture, Jesus repeats the question again. The soldiers and the Pharisees have all kind of taken their step backwards and fallen through the ground. And so he asks once again, whom are you looking for? 
Jesus of Nazareth, I am, he says once again. It's almost as if as he's trying to emphasize the fact that it's not a man that you're looking for. You're looking for the Messiah. I am the Messiah. I am who I am. I am the name of God who have come to save his people. It's the same question that we need to be asking this morning about who we're searching for, who we're seeking, as we think about that in our own hearts and lives. It's an interesting comparison in the Gospel of John that this question Jesus asked twice, who are you looking for, actually had its beginnings in the first chapter of John. Jesus is hanging around the, the disciples of John the Baptist who are kind of ignited by John the Baptist preaching, but they're, they're looking for something more. And when Jesus meets them, he says, what? are you looking for? Same question, except it's what are you looking for? By the end of his ministry, it's who are you looking for? What is the Messiah? Who? It is Jesus. The what of Messiah has become the Son of God, a person, Jesus of Nazareth. If you are seeking Jesus, the good news is this. Jesus is not hiding. He's not hiding from anyone who seeks his love, his deep, deep love that the choir sang about. So ask yourself this morning, who are you looking for? Who are you looking for this morning? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, if you ask, it will be given to you. If you seek, you will find it. You know the next one? And if you knock, it will be open to you. For everyone who's who asks will receive, and the ones who seek will find, and the one who knocks, the door will be open. Who are you seeking this morning? Who are you looking for? He's not hiding. In fact, we can use one of the I am's today to say that Jesus is the way the truth, and the life. And he's not hiding it. He's got it open for the whole world. But for this morning, the question is to you. Who are you seeking? Who are you truly seeking in your life? What do, what do the priorities that you have in your life tell you? What or who you're looking for today? Seek Jesus Christ. The way the truth, and the life. Let us pray. Holy God in heaven, as Jesus is arrested, as he prepares to lay down his life on his own authority, on his own volition, we recognize the deep, deep love that he has for the world. And so this morning we ask once again that our search for purpose, our search for meaning, our search for wholeness, will find it in Jesus Christ. And if only we will look to him, we know that he's not hiding, but that he is the way and the truth and the life. And we are so thankful. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The hymn we finish with this morning is number 292, What Wondrous Love Is This? A beautiful hymn about God's love leading to the cross. The third stanza, though, is the one that stands out for this particular sermon and series because then it talks about the great I am. The great I am. So we're going to finish with the third stanza this morning, standing to sing only the first, second, and third stanza, number 292. Let us stand.
This has been the worship service from Trinity on the Hill United Methodist Church, a production of Trinity Methodist Television as an outreach ministry to those of the Augusta area. If you found this to be a meaningful service, let us hear from you by calling 738-8822 or writing Trinity on the Hill, 1330 Monticello Avenue, Augusta, Georgia, 30904.